Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series, facilitated by renowned educators. ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. Ultimately, push comes to shove. The U.S. still wins in a trade war against China. Um, we think, for a lot of different reasons that we don't have time to go into. So I don't think China really wants to get into this. Um, and because of that, um, I don't think you're going to see any, uh, well, well, we'll see. Um, but it, it's ugly. it would be ugly across the board because the fact is that China's driving global demand. It's pulling the global wagon. So neither side wants this to happen. But we don't see a, a real shift. Number two. Uh, the reallocation, if they were to shift somewhere else uh, of their currency, uh, somewhere else and buy another currency um, other than the dollar, it really doesn't change the dynamics because of the, what happens. You know, China still comes in, suppresses their own currency, um, and the relative value of the currency they're buying goes up relative to the Chinese currency. And let's use the, the recent buying of the euro as an example. Um, there's been some evidence that China has gone in and bought the euro over the last couple months. Um, to give them support uh, in some way. They're just trying to be nice, but the reality is if they come in and buy the euro, it pushes up the value of the euro relative to the Chinese yuan, which is still still pegged, although it's supposed to be floating um, to a larger degree, but it's basically still pegged against the U.S. dollar. Um, It pushes up the value of the euro, and what does that do from a strategic standpoint? It puts pressure on Germany, their major world competitor, um, you know, to... Uh, from a trade standpoint, so this, so, so whatever happens in the world, there's always a push uh, and a pull, and there's always going to be a feedback. So, so this reallocation shift um, back out of the euro doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's, or that it's necessarily negative um, for the U.S. dollar um, in terms of trade flow and the way it, it all plays out across the global economy. And number three goes back to the point, where else do they hide? The capital markets just aren't big enough and deep enough, given the size of China's reserves, um, to move elsewhere. Can they move into um, gold? Yes, but it's a small relative market. Can they move more into and just physical demand and the commodities? Yes, and they're doing that to a large uh, degree and have done that. But they've also realized that all the massive stockpiling they do uh, tends to hurt themselves because they drive the price up uh, on themselves. So I think you're going to see a little bit less of that in the future, despite the, the big man, the big demand that should continue for global commodities uh, from China. So we just don't see this um, this, this this idea, this scare idea of, of China running out of the U.S. dollar um, as as being very valid, especially given their demand, their their need. Um, to export to the U.S. and their need to get into the U.S. capital markets. If they were to crush the U.S. dollar, um, their their existing massive holdings of U.S. treasuries uh, would be hit very, very hard, too. So that's another thing in the background that, you know, kind of keeps that balance of power in place. If you really want to read more about this and investigate why this is, this idea of, of China running from the dollar is a bit of a canard, um, I suggest, and I've talked about it before, that Michael Pettis, um, M. Pettis, uh, dot com uh, is a blog, and it's a very, very great blog. Um, Pettis is a professor at, at Beijing University, and he's able to put your phone, Steve. And michaelpettis.com, if you go to his blog, he writes about this a lot, and I think he does it in a, in a way that, that, that makes a lot of sense and, and it kind of gets it kind of gets through those scare tactics and gets that out of the way. Um, the address is m um, for Michael p e p t i s dot com. Okay, um, as I said, the the real problem in the world just once you get beyond this idea of the of the dollar going away, and which we which I think is is really not the case, and and hopefully I've covered covered that. You, you do get into this, uh, the real major problem in the world is, is this, you know, beggar thy neighbor policy on the currency side of the fence. And what I mean by that is every country in the world wants to export, but the global demand uh, isn't there for everybody in the world to drive exports. And the reality is that the U.S. consumer is still taking most of the demand here. This is a chart from, from the, um, I think it's from the, from the Bank of International Settlements we got this. Um, and it just shows the 
current account deficits uh, of, of really all the major countries in the world. And we spiked out a few of those. And the, U the United States is negative 3.3. Germany plus 5.5, and if you look at the euro area, Germany's plus 5.5, and the rest are sucking wind to a large degree, uh, except for the Netherlands, and which is a you know a smaller economy relative to Germany. That's an important point because you're seeing this whole idea of global rebalancing not taking place in Europe, and the imbalance is increasing in Europe among the key countries um, that are uh, under the single currency, the euro, and this whole idea of this uh, in this imbalancing increasing, meaning Germany sucking the wind out of the rest of them, is creating more risk and dislocation in Europe. But if we think of Germany just from the major global exporter, um, big surplus, look down here, Japan, plus 2.8, big global exporter, decent surplus. Hong Kong, which is a function, too, of China's trade, plus 12%. Current account surplus, Singapore, plus 22%. And all the newly industrialized area, Asia, plus 6.6%. And there's the big demand guy right there, the U.S. consumer. So the problem is that if the U.S. doesn't rebound in a very, very, well, not even a big way, but if the U.S. consumer doesn't rebound and goes back into a shell, and this deficit were to improve, this current account deficit were to improve, these export models um, that are highly dependent on exports that drives their GDP growth. The U.S. consumer falls out of bed and demand falls. The U.S. GDP on a global scale is already low and getting lower. If these guys start to take the brunt of the U.S. consumer going away, as you can look at these numbers, um, then their GDP growth falls. So the relative GDP growth of the global economy could fall very, very fast if the U.S. consumer comes, comes unhinged again. Unhinged is a double-dip recession. And a double-dip recession precursor here is probably um, this idea that if jobs don't start to rebound soon, um, you know, we could slip into a double-dip recession, especially given consumer sentiment and a lot of other numbers that, that we've looked at. What happens here? Well, what happens is a lot of the stock markets in the world um, are continually based on growth in China, um, uh, continuing based on a recovery in Europe, based on the, the good numbers we've seen in Germany, although the July numbers in, in Germany were worse than expected. But expecting the continued healing um, in Europe, continued healing in the U.S., but healing also is really has to come from the U.S. consumer. So if we see global growth decline based on a double-dip recession in the U.S., we will see it. Then the stock markets that are based, that earnings are based on this growth, it ripples through to them. And ripples when, it's, when the stock markets start to take hits, it means global collateral um, starts to take a hit. We get risk aversion. We get run out of risky asset classes, and where does the money flow? It flows again to the deepest capital markets to hide, and the U.S. dollar tends to be the winner. The reality is, as ugly as it is, um, we, can't, we, we just see so much risk in the global economy based on these numbers, so much potential risk. So you can see how the U.S. economy here is the major demand taking these exports from these other economies that are highly dependent on the export models that don't have balanced economies um, with consumers. Old Uncle Sam here um, is still carrying a lot of, a lot of weight with this 3.3% current account deficit. This goes to the point I said earlier. Because the U.S. is set up as a world reserve currency, they tend to be locked into these um, current account deficits um, into perpetuity if they, want to, if they want the dollar to lubricate the global economy. The dollar, it plays that role. So, we're lo so we tend to be locked into these current account deficits. But notice how these deficits are starting to improve lately. Um, at 6% in 2006, 5.2%, 4.9% U.S. current account deficit improving. As the U.S. current account deficit has improved, what's happened to the global economy and what's happened to global markets? They tanked um, in a very big way, and you see that. And that means demand is coming out of the world as this improves. As these numbers get better in the U.S., um, the, the numbers elsewhere get worse. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.